Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is the uh, public information session regarding the um, Paper Mill Playhouse and uh, a financial request that was made last year. Um, I don't want to spend too much time speaking before I hand it over to Mike Stotts, but again, just wanted to let everybody know we are being recorded. We are on Zoom. We do have a few people participating via Zoom. Um, and we do have a hard stop at 7 p.m. So the objective here is to uh, have Mike and Mark and eConsult um, speak, and then Matt and I will speak a little bit from the township perspective, and then um, we'll open up the question and answer from the public. All right, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Stotts. Thank you, Alex. And I'm actually gonna turn it over to Mark Kobe. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about economics in a moment, but first and foremost, Paper Mill is an artistic organization. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the other things that we offer to the community aside from the economics. Is this, yeah, that should be live. Is this hot? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that works too. Hi everybody, um, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Mark Hobie. I am the producing artistic director at Paper Mill Playhouse. Um, I've been employed there for over 20 years. Uh, I think most of you in this room probably know what we mainly do, which is the musicals that we put on each year, but I wanted to give a little context and background uh, and delve into a little bit more of what Paper Mill is. Um, Paper Mill is a not-for-profit arts institution and was one of the early founders of the regional theater move movement. We are not a commercial entity like a Broadway theater. We exist as a service organization providing entertainment, arts education, and access services to the residents of our surrounding communities. We are the largest producing musical theater in the state, which means that what you see on our stage was cast, rehearsed, and created by the Paper Mill team, sometimes with commercial partners and sometimes in collaboration with other regional theaters, but always specifically for our patrons. It's true that many of our shows enjoy a life after the run at Paper Mill. Some go on tour, some move on to Broadway, like our recent production of The Great Gatsby, which just announced that it will open in New York City in March. But unlike presenting venues like NJ Pack, Morristown, the Count Basie, who book in shows, Paper Mill creates what you see on our stage. And it's no secret that we are mostly known for the high profile and high quality main stage productions that we do, but that's just a portion of what the organization does to serve the community. To begin with, between the main stage productions, our weekend children's theater on stage school time performances and our arts education and classes and programs, Paper Mill brings over 200,000 people to Melbourne each and every year. Our education programs reach over 40,000 students in 19 of the 21 counties in the state of New Jersey. We have theater school classes that operate year round and which are held both up at the theater and at the Paper Mill Studios right here downtown. One of our most impactful programs is the Adopt a School program which provides arts education and experiences for 16 high schools that cycle through a four year series, which starts by bringing students to Paper Mill to see shows. Then we send artists out to the schools to teach workshops. We place an artist in residence at each one of those schools so that the students can create their own productions. And then in their senior year, we bring the students back to view productions of Paper Mill again as part of our Young Critics program. They must then write and submit reviews of the shows they've seen, and this improves their critical thinking, their powers of analysis, and improves their writing skills. At the end of each year, we hold our Rising Star Awards ceremony, which is a Tony Awards style celebration of excellence in New Jersey high school musical theater. Awards are presented in the same categories as the Tonys, but also include acknowledgements for aspects of everything it takes to put on a high school musical. This year, we will send professional adjudicators to evaluate productions at over 100 high schools across the state of New Jersey to decide which are deserving of a Rising Star Award. Over the summer, we hold our highly competitive Summer Musical Theater Conservatory, which is a five-week competitive and intensive series of classes in all disciplines of musical theater art form, culminating in the New Voices concert on our stage, which is a fully staged, choreographed, and orchestrated performance showcasing the talents of over 120 of the area's most talented young performers. 
We also have two week, a two week summer intensive program, which is a condensed version of that conservatory and several sessions of a theater camp, which run in July and August for those young people who are just starting out in musical theater or who wanna learn more about it. In addition to education, um, access is a very important component of what we do at Paper Mill. And we provide access services to each of our main stage productions. Those services include, but are not limited to large print and braille programs, open captioning, which is where you can see the words on a little digital readout screen, which Paper Mill pioneered in the 1980s, ASL signed performances for those with hearing loss and audio described performances for the visually impaired. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Paper Mill Playhouse was the very first theater in the country to present a comprehensive autism friendly performance, a model that has been copied by Broadway and by hundreds of theaters across the country. Several years ago, our Director of Education, Outreach and Access, Lisa Cooney and I, were invited to Washington DC to speak with the National Endowment for the Arts about our autism friendly performances. After that visit, Paper Mill has shared its tips, techniques, resources with theaters all over the United States so that they too can provide a judgment-free environment for these families to enjoy live theater. Out of those artist autistic friendly performances grew the Theater for Everyone initiative, which provides arts education classes to students with a variety of physical and cognitive challenges completely free of charge. The classes are open to include parents, siblings, and other members of the family so that as a group, they can experience these arts experiences together. Under the same umbrella, Paper Mill Education Department has been working for years with the Pilar School on a project called Lend Your Voice, which lets Paper Mill's neurotypical students lend their voices to make a fully realized musical for the children of this school, many of whom are nonverbal. Several years ago, Paper Mill began offering community, community engagement nights at the theater. At these special performances, the entire theater is open and Paper Mill makes tickets available free of charge to organizations that work with under-resourced and marginalized constituencies. Some of those groups, just some include the Opportunity Project that's here in Melbourne, the First Baptist Church of Melbourne, Essex County Civics Club, Essex County Cops for Kids, the Jewish Community Housing Corporation, the New Jersey Veterans Network, Patterson Music Project, and the Refugee Assistance Partners of New Jersey. We also, I'm not sure if you're aware, we have an art gallery on the second floor. And over the past three years, we've dedicated that space to showcasing local artists. We are currently working with Jesus Nunez, who has a gallery in Hillary here in Melbourne to curate a different showing for each of our main stage productions. And some recent highlights include a gallery exhibition for Native American Heritage Month, featuring the Red Dress Project and the work of Oleana Whispering Dove and Jeremy Dennis. And for Black History Month celebrations, we included a gallery exhibition titled Afro Afrofuturism, 100 Years After the Harlem Renaissance. In addition, we have saluted other cultures with live events. Just one example, last May, we held an Asian American and Pacific Islander celebration in collaboration with Milburn Short Hills Desi Club, the Milburn Short Hills Korean Parents Organization, and the Milburn Short Hills Chinese Association, who awarded us a plaque of appreciation for our ongoing partnership. We've provided entertainment in the form of professional and student singers for Milburn Township events like the Winter Walk. And we recently renewed our relationship with the Milburn Middle School by providing a special performance just for those students of our re recent production of Fiddler on the Roof. We're talking about ways to continue that effort with the middle school for upcoming seasons. And we also hope to have two sections of our summer musical theater conservatory in residence at the middle school this summer. All of those talks are currently happening. So other than the main stage productions, I hope this gives you a taste of the many facets of this amazing arts and education institution, which has gained national and international recognition and is located right here in downtown Melbourne. And now I'd like to bring up our executive director, Mike Stutz. 
All right, thank you, Mark. Uh, some of you have seen me up here three times already talking about the new paper mill project that is being discussed in town. So for those of you who have heard it before, forgive me, here it is again. Um, uh, but I'm gonna give really more of a summary tonight. So the greatest weakness for the viability and future growth of paper mill is the physical condition of our existing facility and the campus where we operate. When compared to peer theaters across the country, paper mill's physical plant is severely inadequate, is costly to maintain, and does not meet the needs of a 21st century entertainment facility. Much of our uh, physical plant is functionally obsolete. The oldest part of the building dates back to the 1930s, and the rest of the building was rebuilt after a fire destroyed most of it in 1980. Bathrooms, circulation spaces, lobby areas, exterior pathways, drop-off areas, ingress egress, in egress points are all in a state of obsolescence and deterioration. Building systems are highly inefficient and costly to maintain, and the facility is not in compliance with ADA code requirements and cannot be brought up to standard uh, in its current condition. In addition, there are some safety issues, including failing retaining walls on the west side of the facility and parking lots B and C, uh, a deteriorating wall, uh, retaining wall on the Rawway River side of the facility, and there are underground uh, water uh, penetration concerns uh, that during high rainfall events continue to plague the theater with flooding. There's inadequate lighting in the parking lots for the safety of the public and our staff. These concerns pose liability risks for both the township and for paper mill and will only become worse over time. So we're proposing this massive, some might say, uh, physical renovation project, uh, but it's, it's, it's large in terms of uh, what we're proposing for the front of house and some of it you can see here. Um, the main point is to bring paper mill into the 21st century. Key elements to the renovation are upgrades to these buildings and grounds that will greatly improve safety, functionality, ADA compliance, and aesthetics, all of which will culminate in a welcoming new modern facility that offers fresh contemporary openness and energy while honoring and celebrating the long and vibrant history of the paper mill campus. Um, so what you are seeing here is a complete renovation of the front of house, which is all of the public facing uh, part of the building, including the lobbies, the bathrooms, milling spaces, box office and concessions, making it a welcoming and vastly improved patron experience and accessible to people with disabilities. Um, we will be doing some refurbishments to the back of house. These are largely cosmetic, but also uh, HVAC improvements to improve the functionality of uh, our air conditioning and heating. Upgrades to the entire campus include new lighting, and signage in the parking lot, safety features, repairs to the retaining walls in the parking lots, uh, and the mitigate, mitigation of underground water issues. Um, an expansion of the carriage house uh, restaurant. Um, as many of you will know and will recall, we purchased the property at 20 Brookside right next to us last year. And so we are proposing that uh, we, uh, that the township acquire that property to make it all one contiguously owned property. <laughs> but that we expand the carriage house as well to increase the capacity of the restaurant and also gain a meeting space, which we're in desperate need of. Um, a rebuilding of the beautiful facade uh, that currently exists on our existing building, we are proposing that it be rebuilt as an entrance to the carriage house and create a new gateway to the entire paper mill campus that will be able to be seen as you're entering our campus from the downtown area. And eventually then a new education center uh, to be located hopefully in downtown Milburn uh, to serve the growing needs of our education department as Mark uh, just explained. To date, we've received approximately $21.4 million towards a $40 million goal for this entire project. The state of New Jersey has made a $3.75 million uh, grant, and the remaining $7.6 million has been raised with private philanthropy, primarily through the Paper Mill Board of Trustees. Today, we are coming to the Milburn Township to make an investment in the building and property it owns of $7.5 million, less than 19% of the overall goal. 
The balance will be raised in the next act capital campaign, which we plan to announce to the general public sometime in 2024. The township support would specifically cover the following costs. The cost of acquiring 20 Brookside, allowing for the consolidation of the relevant parcels under single ownership by the township. The cost of rebuilding the historic facade on the south side of the carriage house. The cost of repairs to the retaining walls and drainage mitigation in parking lots B and C, repairs of the Rawway River retaining wall, mitigation of the underground water penetration uh, issues in the existing building, and the cost of new lighting and all parking lots used by the paper mill. We are not asking the township to fund the cost for the expansion of the lobby, the increased restroom facilities, the upgraded HVAC and lighting systems that will uh, be energy efficient and easier to maintain, the enlarged carriage house, the energy efficient windows, the new walkways and patios that will prevent trip hazards, the new dressing rooms that have not been touched since the 1930s, the paint and carpet for the offices, the new roofs that currently leak in a variety of locations. For all of those improvements and upgrades, we will use funds raised from the Next Act Capital Campaign. So while it would not be necessary under normal circumstances to um, compare us to other theaters, I think it's important to contextualize a little bit for the audience here where Paper Mill fits into the professional uh, landscape of theaters in the United States. First of all, there are quite literally thousands of theaters in the United States that range from tiny storefront theaters to large expansive outdoor venues. In New Jersey alone, there are over 40 theater companies, not including any of the presenting theaters who book concerts and touring shows. Paper Mill is one of the oldest not-for-profit theaters in the country and one of the largest. With an annual operating budget of between 25 and 30 million, we are in the top tier of regional theaters, along with Center Theater Group of Los Angeles, ACT in San Francisco, Arena Stage in Washington, DC, the Goodman Theater in Chicago, American Repertory Theater in Boston, Manhattan Theater Club in New York, and others. These are uh, these and many other theaters are used as the benchmarks for paper mill in terms of our budget and our allocation of costs, our union contracts, and so uh, and so on. Um, we're also uh, benchmarking or used as benchmarks with those theaters in terms of our level of production and our operations. Over the past several years, many of these theaters have undergone significant expansion or renovation to their aging facilities, just as Paper Mill is recommending. These include the Alley Theater's $73 million renovation, Arena Stage's $100 million renovation, Huntington Theater's $55 million renovation, and there are others, uh, Milwaukee Reps, $75 million, Locally, NJ Pack's $180 million new education center, Count Basie Theater in Red Bank, 26 million, Dew River Theater Company, 15 million for their recent expansion. What Paper Mill is not is a Broadway theater. The comparison of Paper Mill, structurally or otherwise, to a Broadway theater is a false equivalence. Broadway theaters, for the most part, are for profit venues confined to a very dense densely populated area of Manhattan. There is not a single Broadway theater in a suburban neighborhood with the bucolic setting that Paper Mill is known for. That said, Broadway theaters, theater owners face many of the same issues as Paper Mill with obsolete systems, limited lobby space, and inadequate restroom facilities. And there are plenty of examples of renovations of Broadway theaters, including the current $50 million renovation of the Palace Theater, which is being raised uh, 30 feet above street level, and the recently reopened James Earl Jones Theater, which built a 20,000 square foot annex to improve its audience experience. Many people in this community will recall the financial challenges Paper Mill experienced in 2008 when it nearly had to close its doors. There is no question that the actions taken by the township to save Paper Mill from its then financial challenges resulted in one of the most successful turnarounds in the history of the American Regional Theater. Milburn should be proud. Today, we are coming back to the township from a position of strength and vitality. The prominent role that the township played in 2008 cannot be overstated, 
nor can the enormous return the township has received from that $9 million investment. It is our ardent hope that the township of Milburn will once again play a significant role in securing the future of one of its most critically important and valid community assets. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to Brian Licari of uh, eConsult Solutions of Philadelphia, who recently completed um, a revised economic impact study of uh, the economic impact of paper mill on our local communities and on the state, but we'll talk specifically about the economic impact here in Milburn. Hello, good evening. Uh, so I'm Brian Licari, uh, director with eConsult Solutions based in Philadelphia. Uh, so we're an economic consulting firm uh, that does a number of these studies. We've done uh, hundreds of these studies over the years. Um, and we've worked with a lot of different types of entities, uh, you know, major corporations, sports teams, uh, and also uh, a lot of uh, arts and cultural um, organizations, and, and especially those with, um, you know, with that generate patronage uh, and have visitation uh, that's part of their their impact and so uh, we have uh, you know did a study in 22 uh, we did an update to the the study uh, and so with an economic economic impact impact study um, just to sort of explain what what we're measuring um, so when you have an organization uh, like paper mill that spends money for its operations uh, in this case 25 to 30 million a year, that spending generates additional economic impacts in the in the community and local economy. So in order to maintain operations, uh, the theater has to um, pay for contractors, pay for materials, any other spending that is used to support the performances. And so those are indirect impacts. So all the other companies that are then relying on the business from paper mill to support their own employees, those are indirect impacts. Um, paper mill also hires its performers, uh, its contract uh, performers, other uh, you know, aspects of the administration, any other people that are used uh, to, to support the performances. Uh, they then bring their money home and spend it on groceries and uh, retail and housing. And so those are induced impacts. So when you put it all together, you have a direct impact, an induced impact and an uh, indirect impact that then creates what we would call an economic footprint to really understand what is how much of, of the local economy is sort of generated from these operations. And so we looked at sort of two different scenarios. First is the capital investment. So with significant investment uh, for the facilities, that's gonna generate an impact, but it's, we'll call it a one-time impact because when the construction's done, those impacts are, are sort of already experienced, but with such a large um, investment, um, we're talking about uh, a, an impact of 36.6 million um, on, on Milburn uh, and uh, nearly 55 million um, in impact for Essex County. So then continuing on, with those ongoing operations, uh, those impacts. You have the spending of uh, paper mill generating uh, impacts of uh, 32 million, nearly 32 million in, in Milburn and uh, just over 50 million in Essex County. Uh, but in addition to that, you have all of these patrons coming in who spend money at restaurants, uh, spend money on transportation. Uh, so we call that ancillary uh, spending and impacts. So with these studies, we often, exclude locals because we'll, you know, we make the assumption, well, if I'm in, uh, if I'm here, I'm going to spend my money somewhere else if it weren't for paper mill. But paper mill is a, is a generator of activity because it brings in people from all over the state, all over the region, uh, internationally. And so uh, these people come to town, come to see a show, go out to dinner before or after. And so those impacts are also counted. So when you put it all together and look at that total economic, uh, economic footprint, in Melbourne, we're talking on an average annual basis of nearly 36 million, uh, supporting 260 full-time equivalent jobs um, and generating 19 million in wages uh, for Melbourne. Uh, when we look at the county, uh, that's uh, over 56 million in economic impacts, 340 jobs and nearly 25 million in annual uh, wages. So uh, a significant number um, also a generator for tax revenue uh, for the state as well. But I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Sometimes these studies can be sort of overwhelming with the numbers, but it's really understanding kind of where this, you know, what we're talking about with the, 
spending of the theater, spending of visitors, and when you put it all together, you start seeing what those impacts are. We're gonna answer questions in one moment, okay. but we're gonna turn it over to Alex for a few minutes. Yeah, so <clears throat> at the previous um, information session that was held at the paper mill back in December, um, my, myself and Matt Laracy, the township CFO, were at the, at the meeting. Um, we were largely silent and uh, didn't have much to say in terms of facts as it relates to the township of Melbourne and, and the budget, which I know is an important question as we're all uh, sitting here uh, listening to uh, this request. So <clears throat> what I just wanted to do was provide some additional information of where we currently sit as a municipality. Again, these are just um, the facts of where Melbourne sits. Uh, I'm not speaking for the township committee, but simply presenting where we are in terms of the budget. Um, at this point, uh, Melbourne Township has a $65 million budget. Um, we have $4 million of outstanding debt, which is a 6.1% debt to budget ratio. Um, this in comparison to our surrounding communities is well, well below um, what other communities are currently at in terms of their debt to budget ratio. Um, through the years, the last five years, 2018 to 2023, uh, Milburn has increased its tax levy by 5.33%. Um, this is in comparison to an annual inflation rate of um, 22.2% over that five-year period. Um, in addition, <clears throat> the, uh, the tax levy uh, increase of 5.44% compared to our surrounding communities um, over those five years, uh, the next closest community uh, is at 10.91%. I say all this only to say that the township is in a, um, is in a very good financial position. Uh, I realize that at other meetings and other um, discussions, there is a lot, certainly, that the township has to do. Um, and there are uh, a lot of things that we, um, we aspire to do in terms of whether it's infrastructure improvements, whether it's, uh, you know, building improvements or, you know, other projects, roadway reconstruction, you know, recreation facilities and things like that. Uh, there was, there's never going to be a dearth of uh, things uh, that the municipality needs to do. Um, but certainly, um, you know, in 2008, uh, the decision was made to purchase the paper mill playhouse um, and um, create an asset for the municipality. Uh, just some other numbers that I'd like to just share. And again, um, <clears throat> in terms of the assessed value of all the properties that the township of Milburn owns now. Um, back in 2008, we purchased the property for $9 million. Um, we currently own $10.9 million in, in property uh, over on the paper mill campus. Um, this is not, this is assessed value. This is not what necessarily the value of the property would be if it were sold or if it, um, um, or if you valued it at the current ratio that the municipality is under at this time. Um, I would just also like to point out that the township continues to receive rent from the paper mill. And I understand that, um, you know, that that is no longer uh, a part of this discussion. We are talking about the um, capital uh, investment um, and the partnership between Melbourne Township and the Paper Mill Playhouse uh, and, and the things that were just discussed in terms of economic impact to the municipality. Um, but <clears throat> just for those that may not be aware, um, the township is has a lease with the Paper Mill that could last up to 75 years. Um, that would generate in and of itself approximately, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, $19,740,000 of the useful life of that lease, um, which again, just given the original purchase price and the ask uh, of 7.5 uh, would still end up with a difference of $3.2 million. And this does not necessarily take into account interest on those those notes and it doesn't also take into account any additional payment that would be uh you know in, in terms of the lease <clears throat> um lastly um you know we are i think one of the things that we can say with with factfulness and not uh, necessarily speculating or offering my own opinion is that 
Um, certainly an investment in the paper mill um, and the property will yield an additional uh, value uh, return on that investment for uh, the increased value of that property, whether it's the purchase of of, of 20 Brookside or whether it's the uh, moving of the historical facade, the improvements to the facilities, um, things that, you know, some of the things that I know it's been brought up in previous meetings that it is correct, the lease does not say that we need to be responsible for uh, facility improvements, but I think there is a degree of of ownership there, even if you own the property and it's leased to someone else, uh, that we need to be cognizant of it as a municipality from a liability standpoint. Again, I just wanted to come up and speak a little bit um, and let you know that Matt and I are here to answer questions as well as it relates to the municipality. Thank you. All right, so now we will um, entertain questions. Or if anyone has anything to say about the project, we would welcome your comments now too. So we'll uh, oh. loud mic. Um, we'll we'll start in the room. We do have about um, you know eleven people participating via Zoom. Once we've uh, gotten through the room, certainly we can then uh, turn to Zoom and people have comments or questions on Zoom. So I have a we can come up and speak at the mic, um, or I can certainly hand the mic to anybody that wishes to speak or has a question. Yeah, you can just come up here and speak. And then we'll hand this to the people that want to answer the questions. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I really don't have a question. I just really wanted to make a statement. Um, my name is Abby Speltz. I'm at 58 Undercliff Road. I'm a resident of Melbourne uh, and also a parent, a parent in for the middle school. Um, they mentioned earlier the amazing uh, trip the kids got to take to Fiddler. So uh, to give you a little bit of background about that, we, um, Peg Cypher, who's a phenomenal teacher in our district, reached out with this great idea and we reached out to the paper mill and they actually bent over backwards and worked with us to come up with something really amazing for our students. And the big question they had wasn't, you know, how much work it would be, what a problem it would be. It really was what would most benefit our children. So they went above and beyond and uh, almost brought a tear to the eye with how, with what a phenomenal experience it was for all of the kids. We were able to take the entire middle school to see the full performance of Fiddler on the Roof. And it has had lasting impact for those kids to have this amazing shared experience. So throughout all of what they do, um, it's been great. That's all, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, our hope is that we can continue the relationship with the uh, middle school. We're already in discussions about how we can carry that forward, potentially even make it an annual event. It has been asked of me, what is the return on the township's investment? And uh, there are all kinds of ways that we can try to come up with to compensate the town, reimburse the town. But I think what we really want to talk about is programs like this that will help to benefit the town. I think that's the best way that paper mill can serve the needs of this community rather than offering a discount to tickets or something like that, that, that we actually form a more strategic partnership with the middle school, and give those students, every student who passes through that school an opportunity to visit paper mill one or more times. More questions. Okay. I think it'd be easier for me to do it from here. Uh, ben Stoller, Township Committee member, uh, ran on a platform of transparency, so might as well do some of this thinking out loud uh, for the constituents. Uh, when I look at the numbers, uh, and it's expensive ask, the $7.5 million, and I back out the $1.2 million, I, I guess we have a reserve that we've put in place, and we have $1.8 million that you guys spent on Brookside. So if we back that out, we're roughly four and a half million or so that is the ask, because uh, we do believe we should have that contiguous lot uh, of the space. Uh, so let's just call it roughly five million. So out of the 40 million you're gonna build. Is that, is that better? Oh, there you go. Okay, so out of that 40 million, if we put in net five million, we're getting 35 million of assets back. That's dead. You got a second one there? Yeah. 
Should we put in the budget some new batteries? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Okay, good. So net five million. So the the forty million less the five. The thirty five million is free and clear to the to the project and to the township at the end of the day. Correct. So net net, we put in five. Thirty five comes back. That goes to the paper mill project, free and clear, when all said and done. Okay. So we have to look at that return on investment. That's one way to look at it. The second way to look at it is, and I really like this number, is what was the return on investment based on Mike or Brian Lacari's input for that economic impact, direct impact on Milburn from the time we bought that site for $9 million. What is that return on investment for the township? What does that look like? And then maybe we can model that out for the next 10, 15, 20 years, just so we have a real fill quantitatively. I know all the qualitative pieces. My daughter was in the program that went, she loved it, uh, to the paper mill uh, to watch Fiddler on the Roof. But qualitative is one thing, but quantitative, we need to show the quantitative numbers. This is a big number. And we have a lot of infrastructure and a lot of things that we want to put money to work here in the town. Uh, what does that ROI look like? I understand that out of the seven million we're going to put in gross, it goes to you know fixing the facade, the retaining, the drainage, the water penetration, and acquiring Brookside all good things, I believe. And I do like that it is dedicated to those pieces. Uh, although in the lease, it does say that you are required to maintain the facility. Um, so I'd like to understand uh, some of the things that have been done to maintain the facility over the last you know, few years, et cetera. Um, ADA compliance, over the last several years, those laws have been changing rapidly. Uh, can you just talk about, are there additional grants that are available for ADA compliance? Uh, and have we went out and tried to gain some of those uh, as well? Uh, and then the last piece, if we look at the bond offering, Alex, uh, if we look at a bond offering, I think it's very good to see if there's an arbitrage between what that rate is versus that return on investment. That's why, Brian, I'm so interested in what that return investment is. If there's a six, seven, eight percent spread, because I'm in finance. What does that arbitrage look like for the town? That's the real where the rubber meets the road. So that's my question. Thank you. Um, let me just address a few of the remarks. It might take a little while to get some ROI on the, the initial, but, but um, I'll let you address that. So in terms of maintenance, I mean, paper mill does spend an uh, X amount, and I could give you the dollar amounts that we do spend every year on maintenance. Um, I think for the most part, uh, what we're talking about for this renovation project is beyond routine maintenance. Um, I think paper mill has done the routine ma maintenance. We have uh, put a whole new roof on the carriage house. We have patched parts of the, the roof. We bought a new, one out of seven new air conditioning units. There's seven on top of the roof. I think one in the time that I've been here, which is about five years. So we've done routine maintenance and we've fixed things when they have been broken. But what we're talking about is really transforming the, the building and the campus and, and bringing it up to a new level of comfort and enjoyment for audiences um, for, the, for the next 85 years. Um, there are things that have been put on deferred maintenance. There's no question that some of the bigger ticket items like the retaining walls. Um, we started talking to the township five years ago about the, the issues with the retaining walls. And we've had a bit of a debate in terms of who fixes it and when. Um, and we finally, because of this campaign, decided to roll it all up into one major project. Um, we, we identified those seven specific areas for the township to support because the township is our landlord. And those are the areas where if there is a trip and fall or uh, there is an issue with the underground water, 
These are issues that would affect both the township because they own the asset and paper mill because of our operations. And we think that you know those elements plus the facade, which is in response to the Historic Preservation Committee coming to us saying, I really, we really hope that you preserve this. It's an iconic element. And the acquisition of 20 Brookside, those are the, the areas that we felt were the, 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 that made the most sense for the township to support. So we have maintained the building. Um, what we're talking about is so much more than just maintenance. Um, with regard to ADA, over time, Paper Mill has improved its ADA um, uh, services. Uh, we are a, really a trendsetter in uh, the theater industry for all of the accessibility programs that we've introduced, with the, starting with open captioning and, and sign interpretation. I mean, we've been the leader in those programs, and we do get some funding uh, every year, some annual operating support for those programs. But to do uh, this major renovation that will make the building actually physically accessible is, uh, is gonna be very costly. And I do think that there are grants out there that we will pursue to help support that, but it's not going to be necessarily a, a guarantee that those funds will, will um, be out there. Um, we're gonna continue to try to raise overall $40 million, including what we're asking of the township. And we will go to every source for the unique aspects of this project. It'll be individual donors, it'll be foundations that support potentially only ADA or education or accessibility related items. Um, we'll go for, for general support to support the entire thing. So we're not gonna leave any stone unturned when it comes to fundraising for this project. Um, do you have anything to add on the ROI or do you need some time to sort of figure it out from? Yeah, and I, I think it's with that in mind. If it's, oh. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, yeah, I think that that is a good question um, and, and what that return on investment and what, what you're measuring. Um, you know, there's different ways to approach it. Um, you know, there's the, you know, tax revenue side, uh, but then, you know, as you, as you, uh, mentioned, you know, 5 million investment by the town over a, with 35 million sort of matching that. Uh, and so that alone, you think about a return on investment that, that's happening right off the bat. Um, you know, I think we could always model it out, uh, but if you're thinking of 200,000 patrons, 30 million in annual operational spending, um, that's happening every year. I mean, this is, this is to maintain that impact where uh, if the visitor experience, you know, is not maintained that could, you could see declining visitation. And, you know, so it's a, it can get, it can turn into a, a complicated exercise and somewhat right, hypothetical. Right, that's really the story, right? Mm -hmm. That's the story you want to tell. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, those improvements are the drivers for that success going forward. So if you're going to tell a story, you might as well tell the right story. Mm -hmm. Um, my name is Jeffrey Feld. Um, it's good looking around the room. I see some old friends I haven't seen for years. Like my daughter went to kindergarten with Mrs. Ferrellitos, and she, I became a grandfather. My last, son, my son, my son. <laughs> but it was things, and I'm thinking of the person who built the the, the fields. Um, I don't think anyone really in this room is opposed for maintaining and preserving the asset that is the paper mill. I grew up in Springfield. That's how I learned musical theater. I went to the children's um, things, but it's the question of funding. And I think Alex, this is where we're gonna have some fun. One thing that was said before, you said the debt of the township. That's what we have issued. One thing that needs to be posted is the annual debt statement. We have authorized, but not issued about $10 million for the municipality. Also, you do not discuss the amount of debt that's outstanding for the school, which I think is about in excess of around 50 million. But also, Alex, we have to look at what is our obligations that we have. Um, because in Nine Main Street, this township might be on the hook for up to $30 million. And I think the, the public has to understand how this fits into the whole new structure of indebtedness that's coming into the community. Um, this is really not a comment to the paper mill, but it's something that really has to be transparent when we're talking about the narrative, is everyone to understand what is the debt that's can be confronted by this township, whether it's whether it's the um, nine Main Street, 
the mediation, flood mitigation, which is a big issue because that's really how we're going to restore the downtown area by the flood control. And I think we all had to look at this as a giant picture and let's put all the cards on the table rather than hiding things. Um, as to raising revenues for the paper mill, um, if you're doing a fund drive, many of us have been here for years, sell us a brick as a donation, we'll contribute, put our names on it. Also, my son and his boyfriend are big theater goers in New York. Um, like the tickets that are not used, it's like a hotel room. If you're not used that night, you lose the revenues. Have you increased your use of the internet to say what tickets are available? I mean, because I went to the fiddler on the roof, like on a Saturday afternoon, we made a decision to go like that day, but there were a lot of empty seats. And I think if the public knew that the seats were available, especially for that production, maybe at a discount, you could get the money. Because remember, if a seat's not used, it's like a hotel room, it's lost. And I think we may be using the technology to get the revenues to do that. But the real issue is, as my concern is, this project has to happen. The question is, how does it impact the long-term debt structure of this community, which includes um, what we have issued, what's gonna be out to be issued in other projects and what's gonna happen in the school system. They're all interconnected. So the uh, current authorized and unissued debt is about $15 million of which 8 million is the joint related to our joint meeting, which is our SOAR contract, um, which is uh, for a project that's gonna be FEMA reimbursed. Um, but we have to hold the debt in our books. Um, over the remaining amount, uh, a good amount of that is related to DOT projects. We get grants, but we have to spend the money first. Um, so, you know, that's our authorized but not issued debt is part of our debt plan each year. So we roll forward notes. Um, we pay off a certain amount of principal and roll uh, the unauthorized debt into authorized debt. Um, so that's certainly something that's within our debt plan um, that we're working with. I just want to make a comment about the debt. Uh, because many of you, some of you might know, I was on the Township Committee in 2008. I was mayor of the town, not in 2008, but I was on the committee for 18 years. I was very much involved in the original purchase, as was Alex. And of the $9 million bonds, I guess they were notes or bonds, I don't remember their notes. Those are notes. Um, we pay them off early. We always pay them off early. All of our debt, because one we wanted to save on the interest, never amounted to the amount of money that you see up front. Because we, we I think we did half the time that was originally the notes were put out. And the philosophy of this town, which I believe is still, since Alex just gave us some numbers, is it was always a pay as you go. We didn't want to accumulate a lot of debt, only if we had to. And a lot of it, like the unauthorized debt, it was on the books back then because they're all reimbursement projects. And a lot of the issues that are here today, some of them were there back then. Flood, you know, all the flood projects that were completed, new ones that had to take place, uh, myriad of different issues. Issues don't change that much over the years. But uh, in terms of the municipality, they're very responsible on their debt and always kept it at a low level. And I'm sure, and I have confidence in Alex, clearly that uh, he would follow the same model as he always did back in 2008. That was a huge success for us back then. So that's all. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't give you that. Oh, that's okay. It's, no, it's it, fine. Okay. Is, okay, Diane Eglo. So um, I see Mike and Mark and Alex, you've addressed a lot of the points that were in my tap into letter and thing I spoke, I've spoken to at the past meetings. Um, so is a $7.5 million bond or is it going to be a $5 million bond is my first question. Next question, are you no longer asking to redo the lease to no longer pay rent or will you continue to pay rent as the original um, contract says. Um, so you bought Brookside for 1.8 million. Did, was the township, was Matt and Alex aware of that, that you would be coming back to the town after the fact to be asking to be paid back for that, that you will be making parking revenue of that. You also make residual revenue for Newsies and Great Gatsby that go 
to Broadway, which is a great thing. I'm not anti-paper mill. What I'm saying is, in the vein of transparency, the taxpayers should not be footing this bill. If you already have $21 million, why are you not tapping into that? Um, it's an aging facility. All of our township buildings are aging. We have water problems here. We are sitting on the most uncomfortable pews right now. So I believe our money, our taxpayer dollars should be going to what directly benefits our taxpayers. Um, the retaining wall, you said that that was in discussions with the town. Who was, if you did not decide to wrap this into your $40 million Xanadu project, which I will call it, I think it's a little outrageous to have that glass atrium on our you know, historic paper mill. So what, what was the ending discussion? Who would have paid for that retaining wall? And as far as lighting and ADA compliance, our town is in horrific shape, our downtown. $7.5 million should fix the entrance to Taylor Park on Milburn Avenue, which I walked down there this morning and it's a steep hill. It is far from ADA compliant. The whole rose garden could have been fixed up and maintain the roses for a fraction of this cost of what you're asking for. And let me just see, I just took some quick notes because anyone I would ask you to go to tap into to see the article I wrote. Um, we do not know what the affordable housing hit is gonna be on this town. Will it be 9 million? Will it be 30 million? We have no idea. So I think for now, we should be putting our money into our taxpayers' buildings. And you have raised $21 million. Start with that. And that's what I say. And the paper mill, you get a litany list of things that are so beneficial. It's wonderful. I'm not against the paper mill. I'm saying is that you, as a board, are responsible for your property and maintaining it. Thank you. is very important for our community. We've all seen the buses come in, we've all seen the restaurants get full, we've all seen people come and pay, and I do believe we should, you know, conduct it. My problem is that both buildings, the, um, the carriage house, the water really came on New York accent. My New York accent? The, the building, the paper mill building, and the carriage house, really, the lights are not on enough. You, you're dark more than you are light. And it's that's where I have the problem, because I think that you can bring in speakers. You can bring in, when my kids were little, there's a lot of people here, we had the most amazing kid shows. We had the Nutcracker. I grew up going to Lincoln Center. I grew up in New York. I went to Lincoln Center. It was a very close to that. It was really amazing. Now, I'm not giving this idea with saying, okay, you do it. I'm giving this idea telling you I can help you do it because maybe the board at the, at the paper mill now is not interested at all in elaborating. Maybe we can have two boards. Maybe the township can run the times that you, that you keep it dark. And maybe we can get this to be much more running. That restaurant there's no reasons why you can't do showers and parties and the things that are go on. There's so much more usage of this space that can be done to make you as the paper mill and us as the township work better and, and bring it more alive. So I'm, I'm telling you this as a helper to do it with you because I never give an idea. I've done fields with Ted. I've done baseball. I've done everything. I'm happy to help you do it. But there is a way that we can make this really work, that it can be more light than dark. I thought you were going to talk about our lighting for a moment. So oh. let me just, I'll, I'll address, which is part of the plan is to improve the lighting. <laughs> um, pardon me? Are you going to address my question? Yes, I am. Yeah. So yeah, before we go to the next question. So, um, you know, we explained at the last public session that we had the difference between a presenting venue and a producing venue. Um, we're a producing venue and we appear to be dark. We are dark from public performances for several weeks between shows, but there is great activity going on in the theater. When a show ends at Paper Mill, there's usually a week, 
maybe a little less of loadout. A show like Gatsby was a full week to get it out of the theater. And then the next show comes in and starts loading in and then we have to tech it and 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 do all. So yeah, let me just explain. Yeah, we so so we want to make sure that uh, everyone understands what the the what paper mill is first and foremost. It's a producing entity, and that's our number one priority. The carriage house is now being activated at least four times a week. Um, so outside of the events that we do, uh, the dinners that we serve when we're in performance, we now have murder mysteries and trivia nights and uh, illusionists. So we're making as much use of the carriage house now as we ever have. Um, and so fulfilling some of what you're talking about in terms of the campus being lit more, more frequently. Um, that's not to say that we can't bring in some guest speakers from time to time, but we really want the public to understand that first and foremost, we're a producing entity. And that's what separates us from MPAC and Count Basie and NJPAC, totally different building uh, business model. And the marketing of those events is fundamentally different as well. To come to some of Diane's questions, our ask is for 7.5 million. How it's funded, how it's funded is up to the township. Whether it's bonding, you know, taking uh, some of the funds that are available, uh, that's we're talking about a bonding and and some cash. So, you, so you're essentially talking about the township currently has 1.2 million dollars in reserve, um, and that was to answer your other question about when you were having these discussions about the retaining walls or the or the the Rahway River wall and things like that. The, the, the next step was going to be to come to the township committee and ask them to use that reserve to make those improvements. So having it rolled into this is, is sort of a natural progression given where the paper mill is at this point in time. And so the bond anticipation note uh, would be for $6.3 million. So 7.5 less than 1.2 is a rough figure. So it would be for 6.3. Right. And if we're going to get an asset and put it on our balance sheet, it would all, that, that, that property is going to go on our balance sheet. Is that correct? That trans there's going to be a transfer of an asset to our balance sheet. Is that right? Yes. Correct. There would be. I mean, we're, not, we're not really. We don't. We don't account like that. But yes, we would have an asset. Well, there has to be an asset way. that's going to go on our balance sheet if they're going to give us. If we're going to get that property, there has to be something that goes on our balance sheet versus that note, right? The accounting behind it is so we don't we don't recognize fixed assets on our balance sheet. The accounting behind it, but that would follow. Okay. But there, there, there is a separate accounting of our fixed assets where that's it's a real asset, it's just right. not part of our balance sheet. So it's a little bit different than uh, you know, it's not gap. Accounting. But we're getting we're something for that. Money. Correct. We are getting the we're value getting of the property. We're certainly getting the value. Of that okay. I wouldn't highlight like you're saying on a gap accounting one for one on the balance sheet, okay. but but it would be an asset that we hold. Correct. Okay. So net net, well, it's there's cash, there's an asset, sans the note. Right. If you collapse it to what's the net? I, I just, I'm going to have to make a decision here. I want to understand how the math works. She has a very bond, good they're question. Taking a bond. Is that, what they bring in is not, they're, they're going to take a bond for 6.5 million. You're missing the point. I need to understand the math because there's a decision that's, that has to be made. They're going to get the 1.2 no matter what. It's cash allocated right, to a wall, to a wall. To a wall. You understand? So that's seven minus 1.2. Then there's an asset of $1.8 million that they purchase that's going to come to our books somehow, whatever the mechanism is for non-GAAP accounting, whatever it is for the township. So that's going to come to our books. So net-net, it's four, five, four, six, whatever it is, correct? Correct. You can play with the numbers. This town's going to take a bond for $6.5 million. Right? Wrong? Well, it's going to be... It's going to be <laughs> Yeah, we have to decide. Yeah. 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 The question is, is yeah. the lease payments sufficient to pay? Because right now, the lease payments, if I'm correct, Alex, a couple of years ago, you switched the lease payments going into our general fund. And I think it will be, you know, as part of when we go out to bond, is that the lease payments will be pledged to pay back the, uh, the debt service on the bonds. And I'm yeah, just, oh, yeah. kind of general. Address that real quick. Um, so, so again, we're, when we talk about the municipal budget, we're talking about appropriations and revenues, right? And you could say the, that revenue coming in 
to the, the township's budget, yes, we'll pay for debt service as it relates to. Just so everybody is aware in terms of the township's debt service, it's currently around $1.785 million that we pay per year for debt service on that $4 million of authorized and issued debt. So as if you kind of just take a look at it on a surface level is you're, you're talking about a, an aggressive payment on that level of debt. So debt added to the township's statement, debt statement um, is, is not necessarily going to eat into that budget allocation at this point. Um, and just to address another question by Diane, you know, I, I don't think um, your, your points are lost on me for sure when it comes to township buildings and, and, and their current state. Um, I think it is also uh, an active discussion currently happening with uh, the township committee in terms of town hall renovation. Um, because again, when you look at the, the, the municipality, and, and, and I'm not saying this is a reason to spend all the money, but I'm just saying when you look at where we are in comparison to other communities, you, we have capacity to do the things that we need to do to advance this community, including our own, our own renovation, including you know, the things that are being asked of us here today. Just to answer a couple of other questions that came up, um, the $21 million that we've raised so far uh, was given to us by donors that have their eye on the complete project. It's not money that is fungible. It's not money that can be used for other purposes or to say, this year we're gonna spend X amount to fix Y. It is towards this vision and this project that we have put before them that this project is about the future of paper mill and, and envisioning a bright uh, future uh, that has this building with all of the components as part of its, um, uh, uh, as part of what they've given money towards. And so we can't just say, we're gonna take your money and fix this now because we happen to have the money. Um, we have an obligation to those donors to see the entire project through. And so it's a $40 million campaign. We've raised 21, hoping that the township will invest in its asset um, in whatever mechanisms uh, it can through bonding and, and through cash. And we're gonna continue to raise an additional $10 million from BRICS and all other sources, grants, to try to get the gap filled. And then we're gonna start in earnest to do the renovations. We're gonna hopefully start this summer by doing some of the back of house and we will be spending some of that money. And then we're going to do the carriage house and then we're gonna do the front of house. That's sort of the sequence of events based on a very complicated plan that allows us to keep performances going without having to shut down for what is a major renovation. And we feel it's very important to keep the theater going and not shut it down for 14 months because of the impacts that we have in the community, the patron impacts, the impact that we have on the restaurants and so on. Um, there were a few other questions that um, were raised that I can certainly uh, give you some answers to, but I think we want to get a few more questions out. Crazy question. Commercial property insurance. We pay all of, uh, we pay insurance. We pay all of the insurance. We pay all of the insurance. As the landlord, okay, that surprises me. So you're taking full responsibility with the retaining wall that does? Yes. Yes. To the, to the um, you, do you guys have it also insured? Yeah. They also have it insured. Yeah. As far as yeah. We both do. Victor, yes, thank you for coming. Um, where's the microphone? Oh, there we go. Hi, can I talk? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. My name is Stephanie Malios. I live walking distance to the paper mill and I've spent many, many, many uh, moments there that were all wonderful. I most recently saw Fiddler, which was great. And afterwards I thought I'd go have a drink and the Kirby house was closed. So I walked down to Moonshine and I visited Victor, which was also <laughs> lovely. However, my question is, there's a facility here that I've been going to for literally since I've moved to New Jersey, which is a very long time, even before I moved to Short Hills, is there's there's already underutilized space there, in my humble opinion. Why not have the restaurant open seven days a week? There's parking there. 
there's opportunities there. The Sunday brunch when you're not open, there's people who are looking for another place to go. There's opportunities when, I don't know how many people are in the theater, but 500 people walking out at night, maybe they don't want a cocktail, but maybe they want coffee and dessert. I don't know how much it costs to keep it open, but it certainly seems like there's opportunity there. Um, in addition, I know when you're dark, you're not really dark. There's activity going on behind the scenes, but it's certainly, for instance, on Friday night, I went to backstage at the Shanghai Jazz in Madison. I didn't even know that was there. There was this little speakeasy below. It was great. It was filled with people listening to live music and people spending a lot of money eating and drinking, myself included. Saturday night, I heard another band at the Grasshopper on the top floor of a bar in Morristown with another band, tons of people. And they, the both bands brought their own clientele in. So there's no place like that here in town that can have things like that here. And I just feel like there's space here either now or in the future, can we try and make it as usable as possible? Because I think it's an opportunity that's being missed to, to earn revenue. All right, thank you. A couple, just a couple of comments on that. Um, you know, we, we're trying all kinds of new things with the restaurant. In fact, with After Midnight, you will be able to stay after the performance uh, for some jazz in the carriage house because the show's only 90 minutes. But the number one reason why we're not open after a show is because of the parking issue. You have 400 cars that are all trying to get out. And if someone decides they wanna go have a cocktail in the carriage house and their car is in one of those lots, because of the way everything is parked there, it makes it very, very challenging. So we've talked about different ways to say, allocate a lot to the carriage house specifically, but it's still not enough parking given the number of seats that we have in, in, in the theater. So I'm hearing what you're saying. It's just not as easily said than uh, done than said. Um, but we are looking for more opportunities to activate the carriage house and the entire campus. Um, Victor Delapa, Moonshine Supper Club, 55 Main Street. I've owned and operated that space for the past 12 years here in town. I live next door in Springfield. I've spent a lot of time in Milburn growing up even more right now. Um, I, I don't think that there's a question as to the importance of paper mill, um, how it affects the community, the families, and the businesses. You know, as a, as a humble shopkeep myself, I know that it draws a tremendous amount of people, a tremendous amount of traffic from all over the state that I would absolutely not see in this town, no matter what. Most of what I've done over the past 12 years is try to figure out ways to get people into Milburn that aren't in Milburn already, right? Because there's only so much that can go around after all. Um, there's a lot of things that the town does to help. There's a lot of you know, events and programs and stuff that I think have been very successful throughout the years, but I, I don't think that anything really has affected my business, and just speaking for myself, obviously, no one else, um, as much as the paper mill, um, as far as bringing people into town and into my restaurant on off times, matinees, you know, early birds, Sundays, people that, I mean, we have busloads of people from, you know, Colts Neck. I don't know. Are they, are they really coming to Milburn for anything else? Um, so that works, man. Like I'm, I'm, I've been going to the paper mill for a long time. I bring my family there and my daughter's all about it. I send my staff there when we can. We, uh, I love it. And I think it's great. I think that if we had more like paper mill, our downtown would be a lot busier. I think that our town itself would be a lot more flourishing. There's something to be said about a flourishing town and arts. People follow that. They want that. It differentiates you from the next guy. Isn't that what we're about anyway? I got to go back to work. I got people. <laughs> and it takes investment. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions here? Should we go to Zoom? Alex? Great. Thank you. Thanks on you. I'm We're going to go to the, that's all. Ted, here, I'll take the mic. Although I feel like I'm in a very familiar place. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go to Zoom. We have, uh, we have two on Zoom. Okay. 
Leah? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my name is uh, Leah Perchik. I'm a township resident for over 30 years. And prior to that, I came out here as a child to see the paper mill. Also not anti-paper mill. And I'm going to chime in about what some of the other people said about um, the paper mill being dark a lot. One thing for you to say that you are a producing type of playhouse, and I can appreciate it, but the time comes with all businesses where you need to change, you need to pivot, you need to grow. And there seems to be a dismissive attitude, because it's not the first time I've heard this, about making these pivots. The gentleman who just spoke is right. You enhance the town through your programming, bringing new people in. You're asking the town for more money, yet you're sticking to five shows a year. So the five shows that you bring in generate X amount of dollars. You're looking for an investment that's not going to net the town any more money. The town, this town needs money. As someone spoke earlier, there's a lot of need here for a lot of things that need repairs and improvements. If you're not going to help generate more productivity in the town, then I feel that it's a big reach to ask for the support, the financial support from the community. I mean, is there any consideration that the paper mill will make some changes and bring in some other type of programming? I think there has to be an understanding of how our theater fundamentally works. Um, we could make the decision, I suppose, to become a presenting house, but then you're going to give up on Fiddler on the Roof and The Great Gatsby and A Bronx Tale because of the way our schedule works. And I'd be happy to, you know, sit down and show you our schedule, like literally show you the schedule to... You know, we, we, we have so many more days and so many more mornings and so many more nights and you don't need a lot to do what you're saying. So bring in speakers, you need a couch and some people. It goes on behind the curtain, goes on behind the curtain. You know, if you were a business, you would not... The person would be in Florida seven months a year. I mean, you need to work. That's what a business does. We, we are a business. And I think what's important is understanding our business and the economics of our business and how it works. I'm not trying to be dismissive at all. I just think it's a very complicated business. Um, we are a major business that has a $30 million budget, brings in X amount of revenue, earned revenue, contributed revenue, we have partnerships with international companies that depend on our certain way of doing things. That could be changed, but then I think you've got a completely different organization. Is there another question? Yeah. Brad? <laughs> Hello, <clears throat> good evening. Um, Okay, so I have heard this presentation twice now. I did go to the paper mill one evening in December to see what was going on there and what the ask was. Um, what I think is um, if, if the paper mill wasn't asking for seven and a half million dollars of our tax money, I wouldn't even think about asking to see, have their books open for the last five years, see what you know, what are their cash flow? Where is the money coming from? Are they in the red? If so, by how much? Are they in the black? If so, by how much? Why have they not made all these repairs? All of these things. I have a million questions. I don't know if you have to have an MBA like I do to ask these questions, but this is basic finance about whether you're going to give an entity seven and a half million dollars in the in the business world, since you're a business. Usually it's not unexpected for people who are being asked to contribute that much money to get look at the books. And you know, when you don't look at the books, that's when you really get into trouble, like what happened with Bernie Madoff. The financial, the people who didn't look at his books lost a lot of money. Now, I don't want to totally compare the paper mill to Bernie Madoff, but what I'm trying to say dramatically, this is a theater, right? So I'm being dramatic. I think what um, 
what Jeff Feld says, and that's he's no relation to this Feld, but what he said made a huge amount of sense. Our town is going to be on the hook from millions and millions of dollars, and it could be very soon if the uh, housing project on Main Street is built. We are going to be on the hook for tons of millions. Forget about the plant that's disintegrating that you're sitting in right now. That needs a lot of work. So I think the paper mill is in line with others, supplicants for the township committees, millions of dollars it has to hand out. Um, I don't know what it takes to get to the front of the line. Obviously the paper mill thinks it belongs at the front of the line. I do not, I'm not against the paper mill. I just think this is absurd to be asked for that much money to fix the facade of the building. If the facade was crumbling and it was dropping bricks and hitting people on the head, sure we'd fix it, but that's not where we're being asked for. We're being asked to build uh, something that's a real sh showcase, like something really beautiful that let's say maybe I want to do that to my house and, and turn it into some gorgeous, beautiful place besides just a nice place to live. But am I going to do that? Am I asking someone for millions of dollars to fluff up my house? Or is it just adequate and acceptable the way it is? Okay. Thank you for listening to me go on, but I am getting a little frustrated with this situation. Thank you. That's it. Okay. We've got about 10 minutes. Are there any other questions? In the room. So, do you Saturday production for the kids anymore or not? Yes, we do. Yes. Yeah, there are some days where we have three performances going on there. So, yeah. Just to maybe address uh, one of the things that Fran said uh, was you know, this is a professional business um, with a huge budget that's got a finance committee that gets audited by the best auditors in the theatrical industry every year. And our audits are public. I mean, we're happy to provide that. You've never asked as far as I know. So we, uh, also our 990s are public information. They're available online. Uh, that's the nonprofit tax document. So for complete transparency, uh, the financials are out there. And so, uh, I don't think that uh, anyone is trying to uh, hide anything. And uh, I think the comparison to Madoff is a real <laughs> bit of a stretch. Huh. The Township Committee has the I have the documents. So I have the oh, great. Of, Excellent. I have the, the, the book. So, yeah. You know. And I, I think that is a, a unfair comparison to Madoff to anyone. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, could you put a link to those financials? Well, uh, I'm sure, Alex. Yeah, we can, we can put them up. Yeah. That's all right. Well, there's a way to be dramatic, and there's a way to be dramatic. Right. And we're in the business of drama, and I want to deal. I want to <laughs> leave the drama on the stage, and I want to deal in facts, which can sub be substantiated by our audits, and not fictions. Yes, sir. So when somebody puts a new kitchen in their house, mm -hmm. their house value goes up. Mm -hmm. So you're going to put on this facade and the mm -hmm. value of the property is going to go up. Correct. Uh, do, you, do, you, hopefully, do, you, do you feel that it's going to bring more people to the paper mill? I think it's both going to bring more people to the paper mill, and I think it's going to bring them there for a longer period of time. Because right, right now, if we continue to let the building become obsolete that our audiences and the people who work in the theater are gonna stop coming. Our commercial partners will stop coming. Our staff will not wanna work there. And certainly the patrons will stop coming. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. Uh, I'll just add uh, one last thing. 
Um, so we will certainly make sure that the, um, the audits are posted to the township's website. Um, also, um, <clears throat> just having a brief comparison done with other theaters um, throughout the state from our tax assessor and understanding what the impact to an investment like this would be to our own asset in terms of the value of that property, um, just so that there's some additional information uh, there. Um, the, the only, the last thing I'll just say is, is, and again, I'm not, but, you know, and obviously, you know, this has been a relationship that's been going on for 85 years, but certainly much closer for the, since 2008, uh, when the township did purchase the property. But, um, in the 2018 master plan, um, paper mill playhouse is mentioned 14 times, um, for the township. And, uh, what I found interesting about it was that, uh, there were eight groups that were asked to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And under strengths, five of the eight groups mentioned Paper Mill Playhouse specifically. Another one mentioned arts and culture. Um, so I think, again, if that, I think that gives some, some, some picture to just sort of the importance of this differentiation, like Victor talked about, of Milburn to, say, Springfield or other communities that surround us and what makes Milburn, Milburn different. And, uh, you know, most people will say the Mall of Short Hills and, uh, and uh, Paper Mill. Um, of course, people move here and they say, well, it's the trains, it's the, it's the school system, it's the vibrancy of the downtown. But most people who visit here will say it's Short Hills Mall and Paper Mill. So. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all. Thanks for coming here tonight.